Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Bossed Up webinar, all about navigating holiday networking. We're going to get started in just a few more minutes. I know we have some folks still tuning in to join us, but as we get started, get uh, give us a sense of where you're tuning in from by starting to take advantage of our chat functionality here in Zoom. So either at the top or the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat bubble. Click on that and tell Valerie and I where you're tuning in from and why you've chosen to join us today. Uh, yay, we love seeing all the different places where you're calling in from. And as we get started here, ooh, we got a lot of New York City gals in the house. I love it. Hey, bosses from the East Coast. West Hartford, Connecticut, that's like right next to my hometown. I love it. Um, and as we get started, I also want to introduce you all to Valerie Gordon, who's joining us today as a member of the Bossed Up Trainer team. She's taking time out of her very busy schedule to share some of her brilliance and wisdom with us. And I know you're going to find this next hour together to be a really productive one for anyone who wants to master the art of connecting with others at networking events and telling your story like a boss. Valerie knows a thing or two about that because she is the founder of Commander in She, where she helps corporations and individuals really master the power of storytelling something she learned a lot about through her media career as a 10-time Emmy and three-time Edward R. Murrow Award winner. You can see the receipts behind you, <laughs> Valerie. Emmy's on display, which is awesome. And we're so glad to have you here. Valerie, thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Emily, and welcome everyone. If you're just joining us, Emily's asked that you let us know where you are tuning in from. So join us via the chat feature. Let us know uh, where you're coming from. It's great to see everybody here today on what I know is a very busy week. So I will be mindful of our time together and want to make sure that you get out of this webinar what you are looking for. So please do use that chat function. If there are any questions that arise, Emily will be keeping track of them and I will make sure to answer them before the end of our time together. So yes, I'm Valerie. One, yes, one last housekeeping note too, just for everyone's uh, knowledge. If for any reason you do have to drop off early, you don't want to miss the very end of today's conversation with Valerie. So I will be sending around a recording of today's conversation and webinar for everybody to see and have access to. And we'll actually be posting that recording on the Bossed Up blog on the very same page where you originally registered for this. So if you've lost track of that, you can just go to the Bossed Up blog and search holiday networking because I'm sure there are bosses we know should have been here today, but for whatever reason got busy and couldn't make it. So you can always share this recording after today, but we really appreciate you tuning in live especially Emmy from Denver, Colorado. Shout out to Denver. <laughs> I'm tuning in from Denver today too. Uh, and all of you bosses from all over the country, thanks for being here. And Valerie, thank you for taking time too. Um, I'm very excited to be with all of you today. So thank you. And Emily, do feel uh, free to jump in because you have such great insight and so much great experience and you are the boss. So I want to hear from you as well as I go through navigating holiday networking. So here's what we're going to do today. If I can just advance my slide, there we go. Um, we are going to talk about why our stories matter and how to use them. And how, when you're introducing yourself to someone, how to go beyond just what you do into who you are and why you matter. We're gonna give tips for the unemployed or underemployed or unhappily employed, if any of those relate to you. We'll go through some holiday networking do's and don'ts. And then if anyone ever feels a little, I don't know, awkward, what do I even say? We're gonna give some conversation starters and conversation continuers and also talk about um, how to politely exit a conversation. Finally, I wanna make sure that we focus on your most challenging scenarios. So again, if you have a question during this time, please do use the chat function so that I can make sure I get to it. And I'll also save some time at the end to ask for any of um, your scenarios that you want to discuss so that I can address them. 
So Emily mentioned my background is in broadcast media. I spent more than 20 years putting stories on television. And um, I love stories. And to me, everything is a story. But I realized over the course of my career that what I was doing was more than just preparing stories for audiences. I was surrounded by stories all day long. The stories that we tell about ourselves to other people and the stories that we tell ourselves inwardly and the impact and the influence of those stories on our career and our success and our satisfaction. And how does that relate to networking? Well, you are essentially telling a story about yourself when you network. You're telling who you are and why you matter and why the other person should care about you. And at the same time, as you're preparing for some of these networking events, you're also telling yourself a story about what you want to get out of it. And that's an incredibly important thing. So I start all my workshops by talking about the four most powerful words in the English language. And they are these, tell me a story. So says Don Hewitt. Now, Hewitt was the original creator and longtime producer of 60 Minutes, the journalistic storytelling show, CBS. It's been on the air since 1968. So they're celebrating their 50th anniversary of telling stories, and they haven't run out of stories yet. That's because stories are something we simply can't run out of. Hewitt so believed in the power of this phrase that he used it as the title of his autobiography, the story of his life. And he knew that stories had the power to educate people, to entertain them, and to inspire them. Really, we've been telling them since the earliest of times. They are among our most important connection tools. They're what help us relate to other people. And they're also what make us memorable and meaningful. So how do we use them personally? What, are, what is the impact of our personal stories? And there's three ways that we typically use them in business. We use them to encapsulate our past. That's how we speak about ourselves at a networking event or an interview when we tell people about who we are and what we've accomplished. We also use them when we think about our present the things that we're dealing with, conflict and dissatisfaction and plot twists. Maybe you've been recently downsized at your company or you've launched your own business or you're just ready to turn the page to a new chapter. That's your present story. But also there's a really powerful part of storytelling, our internal storytelling, which is how we use them to create our future. When you think about where you want to be in two or five or 10 years, that's your future story. And you have to have a vision for that. And how we speak of that comes into play into how we network. Because we want to tell people not only what we've done, but what we're capable of doing. So I want everyone to think about when they introduce themselves, laying the groundwork for what might be included in that future story. Now I've put hundreds of stories on the air um, in my many years in media. I've told stories about celebrities and athletes and coaches and newsmakers. And I've told stories about everyday, regular, real life people. Would you believe that 90% of the time, the everyday, regular, real life people are always more interesting? What makes them memorable? Well, two main things. The first is the details of their story. The finer, the better. You know, many stories we put on television had a similar theme, um, triumph over adversity is one. We always root for the person who's had to go through a lot to get to where they are. So it's the details of those stories that's going to separate that story from one another. Just like for you, people might have had similar experience or education or a job title, but it's your specific details that are going to be memorable. That and plot twists. No two journeys are exactly the same. So wherever you are in your career journey, whether you're satisfied or unsatisfied, it's those plot twists, especially the bigger, the better, that are going to give you the greatest momentum for your story. So I thought I'd start today actually by telling you a story about um, a networking event that I attended some years back uh, and give you some of the details of that story and some of the plot twists so you can see how you can change up your story, particularly when you're networking with people, maybe with a goal in mind, or maybe something unexpected happens. Here's what happened to me. So I was at a holiday party for a company that I was working for, and I had really wanted to meet um, 
a gentleman who was at that point just appointed to be my boss's boss's boss. There might have been one more boss in there. There were a lot of layers. But he was recently appointed to the group, and I wanted to have the opportunity to introduce myself, to get on his radar, if he knew me at all, and obviously, hopefully, to impress him and turn that into an opportunity. And he was surrounded by people through most of the party, so it was challenging finally to get an opportunity to talk to him. And when I finally went up to him and introduced myself, I had the strangest feeling that um, he wasn't really making eye contact with me. He was kind of looking like right over my shoulder. And it became clear to me, at least the story that I told myself in my head, that he was looking for someone more important to talk to. That's the story that I went with, which was disappointing. And it might have been true. I would say that I kind of lost a little bit of respect for him that day because I think a sign of a great leader is to be able to make the person you're talking to feel like the only person in the room. So that conversation went nowhere, which really wasn't the way the story was supposed to go. And I headed instead to the bar for what was easily my second or third glass of wine of the night. And because the line was quite long at the bar, I um, wound up getting stuck waiting, and the person next to me was the boss's boss, I think I got that right, that number of layers up, who wasn't someone I was particularly a fan of. He was a micromanager, he was hypercritical, I didn't have a great working relationship with him, and he was kind of the last person I wanted to get stuck with at the bar. But maybe because I was on that second glass of wine, or third, I decided that it was time to change up the story. And rather than making lame small talk, which is what we started doing in that uncomfortable way because we didn't really want to spend that kind of time together, I turned to him and I said, you know, it's been a really great year and I want to thank you for always challenging me. That's all I said. And to be honest, I kind of meant it. I mean, it was true. I didn't necessarily like working for him, but he had made me a better employee. And his response was one of surprise, pleasant surprise. I will say, I don't think he expected me to say that. And with that one sentence, I kind of changed the story between us. We were able then to talk about the challenges of having a new boss in the group and what that would mean and where we could go from there. So at any point, if you feel stuck in your story, know that there are things you can do to create that plot twist and turn the page. Now, he still was not going to be my favorite boss. There were things about his leadership style that I just didn't like. But I will say that the story improved from there on out. So that's my story. And I hope in that you can see that there's the opportunity to be able to plan a future story, to do something in your present that opens up an opportunity for an even better next chapter. And there were three things I did in that telling him that story or telling you the story, how I, how I led with him, that I think are really important. We wanna be sure that when we're representing ourselves that storytelling doesn't feel like fiction. And we wanna lead with three, these three things. Authenticity, we wanna be our authentic selves. Relatability, we wanna be able to have that relationship with the person we're speaking with. Our story should be meaningful to them. And generosity that we lead with a certain amount of generosity to the person we're talking to, that it's not all about us. How often have you spent time talking to someone or hearing their story where you're like, well, what does this have to do with me? And they go on and on and on. That's not a great st storyteller. So we're gonna start with that. And we're also gonna start with the two main reasons why we tell stories. So think about this, what this means for you. We wanna know what is the goal of the story? In other words, why are we telling it? You ever talk to someone and they're telling you something and you just have no idea what the point of it is? And we also wanna focus on the most important aspect of the story, who we're telling it to, who's the audience, and how does this relate to them? So if you're going to bring up a story or as part of your introduction, you wanna know the goal of that and also why it matters to the person you're talking to. How is it of importance to the audience? And we're gonna um, dig into this a little bit deeper with an actual work exercise coming up where you'll be able to explore this a little bit more. Let's talk first about how to set the scene for positive networking. Most stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. When you think about going to a networking event, I don't want you to start at the beginning. I want you to start 
at the end. Meaning, what's the goal of the event? Why are you going? There's all sorts of networking events this time of year. Is it an office party where the goal really is just to be celebratory with your coworkers? Is it a networking mixer for a professional organization where your goal might just be to increase your Rolodex and get some more contacts? Are you job hunting and is the goal really to focus in on a few people who might be able to help you with your job search? Start at the end and clarify the goal. It also helps to know your audience. We just talked about how it's important to relate to your audience. Any research you can do in advance to know who's going to be there and how they might be able to help you or why you matter to them will set the scene for successful networking. I'm really big on recruiting a cast of supporting characters in all aspects of our life. If you're going to go to a networking event, obviously it helps to have people with you who support you or to gather them there at the event so that you don't feel so alone. So again, we start with the goal and we wanna understand who might be on a similar journey or who might be able to help us with that. And finally, we wanna be able to think about the ways that we can present our story, our past story, what we've accomplished, our present story, where we are right now, what are our needs and goals, and our future story, where we see ourselves. And we're gonna do also an exercise related to that, to those three particular storylines so that you can begin visualizing kind of how you would do that, what matters most to you now. So let's start with an exercise that is pulled from basic journalism. I use this one in all of my workshops because they're really simple, basic questions to ask, and they work in so many different scenarios. You might remember them from I don't know, like a sixth grade English class. Anybody remember the five W questions? Who, what, when, where, why? And then the H, they always tacked on the H after for the how. Um, these are the basics of reporting. So how do we use them for personal storytelling? Well, I'm gonna start with the first you so you can think about your own story. Your who is, who are you? That's your name. That's where we begin. Everybody knows this. Your what is, what do you do? And then I'm gonna put these next two together, your when and your where. Where do you do this? The name of your company or location of the country. And the when in this case would be since when have you done this? I once did this workshop live and I asked the when question and a woman said, well, nine to five, but I take a lot of work home with me. Your when would sort of be since when. So, you know, I marry um, a marketing manager for Markets R Us. I've worked here since 2016. So take a moment, if you would, and I'd ask that you do this through the chat button. So if you're, um, if you're open to sharing, we can see what is your who, your name, what is your what, what you do, and your when and where when you've done this. I'm going to stop there and give everybody 30 seconds or so um, to just start compiling that. And I'll even do it as well. Let's see what we get here. I love how similar ours came out, Valerie. Oh, yours is really good. And you actually, you, you, and so you actually jumped at, um, a little ahead to what I'm going to talk about next, which gives a little more information. Let's see if so, we get anyone else. I've got a question for you on this, because the where part really stumped me. What does that usually pertain to? Can you expand upon that a little? So usually it's a company, like the name of a company, if you ah, right, 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 okay. Um, it's not like a geography. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned it, you know, here, you mentioned the name of your company, but it could also be geography, let's say in particular, if you are networking somewhere and you are outside of your yeah. home zone. Um, hi, Jillian. Hi, Sharon. Ooh. And people might be thinking this through. And also people in transition might be thinking through, well, do I talk about who I was or do I talk about where I am now? And that's okay. Hi, Gina. So 
for somebody whose current position doesn't really relate to what they want to do next. Yeah. What do you advise them to? Well, then we're going to talk about how we transition into the future story. I'm like preempting your whole talk. Well, Sorry. <laughs> because you, you've raised the issue with, and by the way, if you're still doing this, you go right ahead. And if you don't want to do it on the chat, um, if you'd rather re remain a little more anonymous, I encourage you just to write it on a piece of paper yeah. or your iPad, whatever it is. Hi, Emily. Um, and um, just so that you know. So here's, so we basically said who we are, what we do, and the when and where of what we do it. And this is how, when you think about it, it's like your basic bio. It's how most people tend to introduce themselves at networking events. Hi, I'm Valerie. Here's what I do. Here's, you know, where I do it. And there's nothing wrong with it, but it certainly doesn't go any deeper than our basic bio. And what we're counting on here is for the person we're talking to, to be interested in either what we do, the role we have, or where we do it. Maybe they're impressed by the company we work for um, or that we own our own company. Or maybe they're impressed with how long we've done it. I've been doing this for you know, 20 years. But for the most part, it doesn't give us any more to go on, which is why the next two questions are so much more important. Why do you do what you do? Now, I ask this in workshops, and usually the first thing I get is I can see that thought bubble over all the attendees' heads because it's like, well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I get paid to do what I do, and I have to pay my rent or my mortgage, and that's why I do it. And earning a living, getting paid for what you do, is certainly an absolute perfect reason for having a job. But my question then is, why this job? Why this particular type of work? Because there's any number of ways that you could make money. Why do you own your own company? Why are you a librarian and archivist? Why is something like this what you chose? Knowing your why and how to articulate it is how to be memorable and meaningful in the conversations that you have. So I see in some of these introductions that some of you naturally went there, where in addition to telling us who you are and what you do and where you do it, you told us a little bit about why it's important to you. If you don't yet know your why, or you're worried that your why isn't deep enough, you know, maybe you chose a particular field because you wanted to have um, a, a lucrative um, career, there's nothing wrong with that. And for a number of people who don't yet know, well, what is my why? I would say it is your life's work to figure out your why. Sort of like that, what makes you tick? Why does it matter to you? And knowing that, knowing that and how to share it, how to articulate to someone else is what's going to make you memorable. As will this, I will say the H, the how, was always like that pesky tack on when we would do this in English class or in basic journalism class. But the how in this case is, how can I be of value to you? So we talked earlier about the idea of the importance of the audience. Why does what you're telling them matter to them? How is it important to them? Your how here is in meeting someone, how can you be of value to this person? Obviously, the more research you've done on your audience will give you some of that how. But for anyone who feels like, well, I don't really know what my value is, trust me that everybody has a value. Whatever your skills are, whatever your background is, whatever your future plans are, those are of value. It's knowing how to determine how to share them that's important. So at your next networking opportunity, make sure you're going beyond the who, what, when, and where and getting to the crux of that why. Why does it matter to you? And how is it important to the person you're talking to? And we'll do a little more on this if time permits about sort of that future story, meaning that if, let's say you've had a career that has ended or you're ready to move on, I would re-ask these questions in a future-minded way. Actually, I can give that to you right now. Maybe that makes sense. So think about if you're ready to move on from your current career to something new or you're in the process of doing so, I would re-ask these questions this way. Who do you want to be? What do you want to do? When and where might you like to do this? Why is this important to you? 
And then of course the how I usually ask is, well, how are we going to make this happen? But in this case with networking, I would still focus on the value that you can have in that role. How can you be of value in this role? So don't fear if you're in transition or unemployed right now, think through those questions as your future story, not just encapsulating your past. What I do too is I help clients take their past stories and their past experience and make sure that we can use it then to create that future story. Even if you spent 20 years in a business that you no longer want to pursue, you have learned skills and gotten experience there that you can use for your future story. Nothing is wasted time. It's just part of your backstory. Okay, so obviously, when we're talking through this with someone at a networking event, we don't want to be like, well, here's who I am, and here's what I do, and here's why I do it, and be really super awkward about it. We want to focus on the four C's of communication, which I would say are these. We want to be clear in our communication about who we are. We want to be concise. I talk a lot about like the 30-second intro. It really doesn't need to be more of that before you move on. We want to be convincing. But we also want to be conversational. You're not going for an interview here. This is a networking event. So you want to keep it light and feeling natural. And all of these four C's together will increase your confidence. The other thing that improves confidence is just doing it, is getting used to speaking with people. And you'll realize that you do get better with it over time. So when we're talking about networking, there's probably three different stories we're going to tell. And thank you, Carrie. And if you haven't yet done your who, what, when, where, and why, you can keep doing that. So thank you. All right. So here we go. We're going to share our backstory. We talked about that. That's what's your why. That's how you encapsulate what you've done to this point. We want to talk about the present story too. Present stories are a great way to connect with people. And if I were to give you the actual story arc for telling a full story, it's kind of complicated with exposition and rising action and climax and all this stuff. So I break it down to three easy points. What's a challenge you've had recently? What's an action you took in the face of that challenge? And what was the outcome? And that's a present day or fairly present day story that you can have sort of in your back pocket to share with someone. Again, these are short stories. They should take 60 seconds to tell. We're not telling someone our life story here and we're certainly not going into a long soliloquy. We're using these stories to relate to people. And then we did also talk about leading to the future story so that when someone asks you who you are, or, you know, what you do or where you work and you wanna move on from that, you can be sure to lead to that future story. So a good example would be um, if you are un or underemployed and someone asks you what you do, there's nothing wrong with talking through your past job function and leading to what you wanna do. I typically tell people to avoid saying, I'm not employed right now and actually focus on what you are doing. Meaning you could say, I'm researching digital marketing companies, you know, that focus on millennials as an audience. And then you can do, give a little bit of your backstory after spending four years working as an account manager. I'm now looking forward to doing something on the client relationship side or whatever it is. But basically you want to talk through what you're doing leading to that goal of the story where you hope to get. Anybody have any questions before I move on about this idea of your why and your how? And feel free at any point to just type them in the chat and I will go back to it. In the interest of time though, I'm going to move us on to some holiday networking do's and don'ts. Some of these may seem obvious, but they're certainly worthy of revisiting. So obviously you can see in the green the things we want to do, and they actually correlate with things in the red to things we don't want to do. So first off, we do want to go. I don't know about you, but I can be kind of an introvert, and I love nothing more than sort of staying at home and getting cozy under the covers with a good book. But you will find reason to go, even if the night isn't a success, whatever that might mean in your mind, even if it's just for the practice of going out and talking to people and telling your story. But you don't want to go without a plan. And that just takes us back to, not that it needs to be a full, fully functional every step plan, but again, what is the goal? If you are going to go, is it just to get out of the house and have a good time? Is it to meet a particular person? Is it to practice your networking 
um, story. You do want to research attendees when possible. So obviously, if this is an office party or department party, then you know who's going to be there. If it's a professional organization, sometimes you can do this research in advance and figure out through the invitation, through Eventbrite, or even by asking the organization who might be there to know in advance who's going to be in the room. But you don't want to, what I would call, missionize your approach meaning that you are going on a mission to meet one particular person, which is kind of what I did in the story I told about meeting the boss's boss's boss. I had made my night about that, and it didn't really go the way I had wanted it to go. And the party didn't wind up being a bust, but you want to be able to go with more than just a singular myopic agenda. I recommend having a wingman woman wingman or wingwoman, and that's going with a friend or a buddy simply because it makes it easier to be able to have someone to hang out with and help with introductions. That's not always possible, and it also sometimes can be a bit of a crutch. So on the don't side, I would say don't stay only with friends. Even if you're at the office party and you're looking forward to hanging out with your colleagues, it's the perfect opportunity to meet other people, and I would set a goal of coming away with at least you know three new connections. So we'll talk through as well what you can do if you don't have that supporting character with you so that you don't feel so alone. I do recommend bringing business cards, um, especially if you're doing networking on behalf of your own business or you're looking for work and you're going through a professional organization or other group. Even if you are unemployed, it's very easy and inexpensive to get business cards made up. Made up. You can do them through staples, you can do them through Vistaprint, you can design them yourself. All they really need to have is your name and contact information. And again, a little bit about you, about what it is that you offer, what's that value. If it doesn't fall into a particular title, you can list a few things that you offer. For anyone who wants more information on that, I do offer free half hour consults. If you're not sure, what are the words I should be using? So I do recommend bringing business cards, but I don't recommend papering the room with them, meaning don't give them out to every single person you meet. Give them out to people that you think it would be valuable to stay in touch with, certainly people who seem interested. Um, but, you know, and if someone asks for your card, you can give it, but don't offer it just for everyone you meet. I've been in networking events where it's really uncomfortable, where everybody feels they have to exchange cards, and then you come home with several dozen cards, and you don't even remember half the people. So think about when you're exchanging information, why? Is this someone you're really going to follow up with? Um, what's the importance of it? And the last thing you want to do, and this has happened to me when I've gone with marketing materials to places, is see them in the trash can or recycle bin at the end of the night because you have given out too many. These are of value and you should only give them out to valuable contacts. Um, obviously, be positive. Uh, but this can be hard sometimes at office parties, particularly if you've had a challenging year where people get together and they start to vent about things. I would say don't complain about anything in this kind of a setting because that's your personal brand too. So make sure to keep it positive. Um, even if you've had a tough year, like I did that one year and I got stuck at the bar with that boss's boss I didn't like, find a way to make that a positive conversation. And then most importantly, you're not there just for the night. You are there to improve your network. So you're going to have to come in with a plan for specific follow-up. And don't forget, obviously, to make it polite. There will be some people um, that will be very open to that kind of follow-up and to helping you and to others perhaps a little bit less so. And you will be able to tell the difference. All right. Going through a lot of information, but a few more do's and don'ts here. Do you plan to arrive with or meet a buddy there? Emily says it's all about the wing woman, and I agree with you. And that at the same side, don't leave your departure to chance, particularly if you'll be drinking and you're not exactly sure how you're going to be getting home. Um, be sure to take care of yourself and make sure you have a plan in place. So what do you do if you are going somewhere where you know no one? There's a few things you can do. I've done this before when I've joined new professional organizations and they have holiday mixers. And for as outgoing as I am, it's really a little awkward to go in the room and not know anyone. So a few things you can do are for a lot of those professional organizations, um, they have a membership coordinator or they have an event planner. And you can reach out in advance and let them know you've just joined or you're coming. 
and could they help introduce you to someone? And I found that for the most part, they're very happy to do that and they're very happy to have you as a new member. If you're still a little uncomfortable with that, something else you can inquire about is volunteering at the event. So if you wind up, let's say, working the check-in table and doing the registration, you're then going to meet everybody that you can then go in and follow up with at the party itself. If you're fine on your own and you have no issue going solo, by all means go for it. But yes, please do make sure you know how you're going to get home safely. All right, moving down this list. I have learned this the hard way. Please eat before you go for a couple of reasons. Um, a, you don't want to hog the buffet table. B, uh, it's really awkward to try to meet people when you are holding a plate of food and a cocktail and someone wants to shake your hand. And if you are going to be drinking, it just makes sense to have something in your stomach. So don't go starving. You can certainly go to enjoy yourself and have some of the food, um, but make sure that you're taking care of yourself and eating something before you go. Similarly, I love a good cocktail. I certainly love a free cocktail. Um, open bars to me are an opportunity to have more than one, um, but I have learned this the hard way too, um, to alternate beverages. So have your, enjoy your cocktail and then maybe switch to a seltzer or something in between just so that you hydrate yourself and you don't drink too much too quickly and wind up doing something you might regret, which creates a great and shareable story but maybe not the impression you want to make. If anybody would like to share such a story with me off the record, I would love to be able to write about it this holiday time and I will change your name and all details so that you don't feel outed. But I'm telling you, you're not the only one who's ever made the mistake of drinking a little too much at a party and worrying the next day whether you made the impression you intended to make. So we always go back to what's the goal of this event. Do initiate conversations, meaning don't be afraid to go up to people and say, hi, I don't believe we've met yet. I'm so-and-so. Otherwise, why else are you there if not to meet new people? But don't overstay a conversation, meaning when you get to the point where you feel like you're monopolizing someone's time or they're clearly looking for an out, it's time to wrap it up. Just like if someone is with you and you're feeling like it's time to move on, I will give you some polite conversation enders. The main thing you wanna do at these events is get them curious about you and leave them wanting more so that you can follow up when the time is right and really then use that network to create your next opportunity. You are unlikely to land that opportunity at this actual function. All you wanna do is be able to open up the door and then walk through it when the time is right. And then obviously you want to be festive, you don't want to be regretful. So think about that with everything from your clothing choices and your shoes to your alcohol intake and just the impression you want to leave. All obvious things, but even I have needed that reminder in the past. So let's talk through some specific and challenging situations. Let's say you are unemployed, underemployed or unhappily employed, meaning you are really looking forward to getting a new job. I don't know anyone who's found an opportunity at a networking event, but I know plenty of people who have used it to be able to get one thereafter. And contrary to public opinion, December is actually a great time to be searching for your next job. Most companies still have December 31st as the end of their fiscal year, and they are making decisions for January. So for anyone who feels like, you know what, I'm just going to wait till after the holidays. It doesn't make sense to even start now. Nobody's hiring at this time. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I do think you want to set yourself up for success. So how do we do that? If it comes up in conversation that you're not currently working, remember I talked about talking through what you do, don't be embarrassed about your situation. Um, many people have been there. It's through no fault of your own. And it's not that big of a deal, particularly in this type of economy where so many people are working gigs or are staying at companies for lesser periods of time. Nothing to be embarrassed about. Brand yourself with what you're doing, not what you're not. So when someone says, what do you do? I gave that example. I'm researching digital marketing companies. You know, you don't need to say, I got fired last month for, you know, stealing from the office supply cash and 
I'm binge watching a, net, a lot of Netflix. Um, you want to lead with your positive future story. And certainly the Netflix part can, can, can come up in casual conversation, but lead with what the goal is. What do you want the outcome of this conversation to be? You want to exchange information, but I would say do not give out your resume, even if you have it with you, and even if the person asks. If someone says to you, hey, we're actually looking for someone to join our market research team, could you give me your resume? I wouldn't say, yeah, look, I have a laminated copy in my back pocket. I would say, I'd love to send you my resume. Could I have your contact information and I'll get that off to you on Monday morning? I just think that there's something about making that plan but not offering it in the moment that um, sets you up for success. You do, though, want to inquire about opportunities and timing. So if you're talking to someone who works for a company that you're interested in, there's nothing wrong with saying, is December a slow time for you? Is the company hiring right now? When would be a good time to follow up? I'm interested in learning more. May I contact you? There's no shame in letting them know that you're looking and you basically want to lay the groundwork for that follow-up conversation. Such as you can also request for other introductions. It has been so great talking to you. Is there anyone else in your department that you think I should reach out to? Might you be able to make an introduction for me? And then of course, don't forget to follow up accordingly with that person. This is how you build a network. You meet one person who's helpful you ask them for other people who might be helpful to you. When they give you those names and you reach out, you then reach back to that first person. Thank you so much for letting me know that I should contact Jane. I sent her an email today. I'll be in touch and let you know how that goes. And then when you have the conversation with Jane, you also ask her, is there anyone else you think I should talk to? And you repeat that process each time reporting back to that first person, hey, thank you so much. That was such a valuable contact. I had a great conversation with her and she gave me the name of someone else I can talk to. And that's how you build your network. It is a lot of work. It does lead to job offers though. That's how people build their network. Finally, take this opportunity at year's end to update your social and professional accounts with the story you want to tell. If you are looking for work, make sure that your headline on your LinkedIn profile doesn't say unemployed. It's fine to say currently searching for my next opportunity, but I would rather see someone say what they are, who they are and what they do. Brand market strategist looking for next great opportunity or brand market strategist focused on a particular part of the business. Start with the goal, the ending in mind, and label yourself there. So those are a few tips for anyone actually in the market right now for a new job. Now, let's get down to the nitty gritty of the actual event itself. I found this and thought it was funny. Does this ring true for anyone? Me, I will not be awkward today. Person, hey, me, good, thanks. Um, anyone feel awkward just when they talk to people they don't know very well, particularly if that other person maybe isn't the greatest conversationalist. So that's okay, you're in good company all the time. Emily says, oh my God, yes. Um, I always sometimes seem to say the wrong thing or blather on a little too long, as I might be doing right now. So let's talk through some good conversation starters. And if you have any of your own that you'd like to add, feel free, <laughs> babbly, feel free to do them in chat. These are just some suggestions. Obvious one, you can just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Valerie, I don't believe we've met yet. And let the other person then introduce themselves back. People actually love to talk about themselves, so the more inquisitive you are and the more you approach this like a journalist would in asking questions, the more likely you are to attract people. Yes, you are there to tell your story and to get people interested in you, but one way to do that is to show interest in other people. Oh, here's the rest of my list, it all popped up. Okay, so we're gonna start with our who we are and what we do, but we really wanna get to the why and how. Another thing you can do is not be work-related. You can ask something non-work-related. I'm big on um, reading the news that morning and opening with something that might be related to something you've read. I would stay non-political. So I don't think you wanna get into a first conversation that has anything to do with um, something that could be polarizing. 
But for example, I had a great um, opening conversation with someone at a media event, and I had read that morning that Netflix was um, playing around with some sort of like alternate endings for some of their content, meaning that the viewer would in some way be able to manipulate like a choose your own adventure type of ending. And I just thought that was fascinating that no one yet that I had seen had explored that type of um, dynamic storytelling. And so it was appropriate at this media event, this article had just come out, I referred to it and I said, hey, has anyone heard about this new plan that Netflix is diving into? What do you think of it? So stay up to date on um, news or trivia, or if your professional organization is in a certain line of business, what's going on in the business on that particular day. Share what you know about that business, but be open to learning. Don't assume that you know all the answers. You could say, I heard this, or I believe this. What are your thoughts? And get the other person talking. And then, really important, and a way to continue conversations is to be a connector. So if you've gone with your wing woman or you have your buddy there or you've met other people and then you make a new connection, you can say to them, oh, have you met Cheryl? You know, she also works in your fields and you bring Cheryl over and you make that introduction and you're able to then go to a second level conversation. Plus which Cheryl appreciates it. Okay, so we've done the conversation introduction and now we're going to get to how to continue the conversation. I call these conversation makers. These are, again, just some suggestions of things you can do to continue the conversation. If you wanna talk in a business sense, you can ask things like, what have been your biggest successes this year? What challenges do you see in the year ahead? This also gives you some information about the company and where they might be headed. What are the companies or your plans for next year? And you can ask who's been influential in your career this year? That might be someone you want to reach out to. And what are you most excited about in the year ahead? Again, keeping it positive. Now, I put in here, remember the specifics, because if you can, these are great follow-up questions. If someone says, I'm really excited that in January, we're launching this new project, then great, in January, you can follow up and ask them about the launch. It'll show that you remembered um, the conversation and how interested you are in it. Something that you can do if you're collecting business cards um, from certain people that you talk to and you just need sort of a moment um, is to excuse yourself in the restroom. Sometimes I even just like put little notes on the business cards or on my phone about who I met and something specific, especially if I really want to follow up with them. It's kind of targeted networking and it can be very helpful. Now, <clears throat> I call this one put a bow on it because I originally called it conversation enders and then I realized that had sort of a negative connotation because nothing ends a conversation as quickly as like saying something wrong. So let's consider this a good way to exit a conversation. Just a few ideas, asking someone, so what's next for you? And then again, following up, what's the best information, what's the best way to get information about something that's something that you're interested in? Consider this sort of like a final question. I like to ask people, where can I follow you on social media? You know, are they on LinkedIn? Are they on Instagram? Are they big on Twitter? And again, making a note of that. And then I make sure after the event to be able to go and do a friend request or a follow, um, particularly with people that I'm interested in staying in touch with. And usually people, if they say they have no social media accounts, I'd be surprised. But um, if that's the case, then you know that you just have to contact them by phone or email. A good question, when or how is it best to follow up with you? And people will let you know um, email's great, or let's schedule a call for early January, or I'm just really busy right now, but check back with me after the first quarter. I mean, that will give you insight. And if you're getting vibes from anyone that like, they don't really want you to contact them at all, I wouldn't take it personally. These are not your people. Time to move on and find somebody else. And then of course the, who else do you recommend I reach out to? You can start building your network right then and there. In fact, that person might even be present and they can make an introduction. But keep in mind, you kind of want to exit the conversation at its peak when it's going really well. You want to avoid that moment where you're clearly still standing there and you have nothing left to talk about. This is an introductory conversation. There will be more to follow. So you want to leave them wanting more. But don't forget to thank them for their time and state your intentions for your plans for following up. 
meaning it's easy enough to say, it was so great chatting with you. I'm going to head over to the bar now, um, but I hope to catch up with you next week by phone or whatever it is that you've discussed. It's perfectly fine to excuse yourself and move on. Um, if you've met your BFF that night and you want to hang out, that's great again. But if your intention was to meet a lot of people, there's nothing wrong with a short conversation and then moving on from it. So these are sort of the main tactics I have for networking and beginning to tell your story. I want to take a moment to allow people to maybe put specific questions in chat. Um, and in particular, I'm curious, what have been your networking conundrums? Um, maybe something that is just challenging for you that you wanted to get out of today's conversation. And I'll give a minute for people to put those in. And if those don't come up, then I have a few challenging things on my own that certainly I can bring up. Emily, what about you? Do you have anything? I love this. First of all, thank you so much, Valerie. This is really fantastic. Um, and I guess my, my question is somewhat selfish because this is something that's happening for me this week. Uh, I think a lot of us are joining this because we're about to head into a lot of situations like this. But for me, I'm heading to a conference in Boston, actually, on Thursday, the Massachusetts Conference on Women. Mm -hmm. And you look at the speakers page, right? And I'm honored to be a part of it. But I'm just so intimidated by some of the people who I know I'm going to be brushing shoulders with. I'm trying to figure out how to prepare to, like, make the most of that opportunity to see those people. But I also feel like I'm not really into the pre-conference email coordinating. I don't have a specific ask. I just want to like open the door to future potential collaboration. What do you recommend in terms of handling those kinds of situations? We know these women are going to be accosted by tons of adoring fans, you know? Exactly. And that's such a good question. So let me answer that and then I'll get to the question that just came in on the chat. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I would say you need to control your internal narrator, which is a really hard thing to do, which has you looking at this list of impressive women who are going to be there and feeling it all intimidated. I mean, what a great opportunity, but stop telling yourself the story that you are any less worthy or that they won't want to spend time with you. So rein in that internal narrator. I love it. I think it's okay to go without a goal, meaning that if you're just there and you know, you're not really sure you're not on a mission, there's no main reason you don't necessarily feel like you need to do the research in advance. I would just go back to that lead with authenticity and relatability. Mm -hmm. I'm really big on just being who you are and even admitting in situations like, Hey, you know what? I'm kind of intimidated here. I didn't expect there to be a thousand people here. Or did you see Michelle Obama's over there? I can't believe it. You know? And I think those are great conversation starters too. It makes you more real. You can usually tell when you're talking to someone whether they're putting on an act or whether they're, they're being themselves. So I would start with that authenticity, relatability, and generosity. Just to begin with, I'm really mm -hmm. excited to be here. What are you talk, What are you presenting on you know, today? Right. And, um, or have you heard anyone who's presenting on this? Here's what I do. And kind of letting it run from there. It sounds like such a great opportunity. And um, I'm hopeful that you'll share with us, you know, what your takeaway is, but it, you know, I just hope you enjoy it too. It's okay to go in without that mission or plan. I like that idea, that recommendation around generosity, because, you know, shining a spotlight on other women doing cool things is part of how we all, it's like part of shine theory, right? Like part of how we can all lift as we climb. Yeah. So maybe if I just approach it from this like generous framework, whereas instead of thinking like, oh, would you honor me with your presence on my podcast? It's more like, how can I help you get the word out about this awesome initiative that you're pursuing? Yes, absolutely. And how can you support them in, your, in their business by giving them a voice on your podcast? It yeah. seems also that's very much in the spirit of the conference of lifting other women up. So I would yeah. go with that, that value factor of how can I be of value to you okay. and let it roll from there. So All that's right. awesome. Okay, I'll so the world. Is it Yulia? 
Um, if you have a difficult name and new people you meet mispronounce it, how do you correct them? Okay, so my question would be maybe whether she's got a name tag and they don't know it. I would just, um, first of all, I'd probably be proactive there where I would say, hi, I'm, I'm Val. I get that a lot. People always think my name is like Victoria or Vanessa or Valeri or something. I would just go right up and shake their hand and let them know what your name is. Now, if someone has introduced you to someone else and they've mispronounced your name, I think it's perfectly appropriate, Yulia, to be able to say, actually, it's Yulia, very nice to meet you, and then move on from there. Um, you might actually find that um, that's a conversation starter where people will talk about challenges they've had with, um, with mispronouncing of names or, you know, I mean, I once had to introduce a guy and his name was Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mike Boring. That was his last name, Boring. So I was like, oh, this is Mr. Boring. And it was just, I mean, it was awful because like, you, you couldn't have that name, and he was a very like, non-boring guy, but it might actually lead to some good um, conversation. That's so funny. Question came in from Sharon about being new in a field and feeling like, um, you know, I don't really have the experience to be here. I would, um, I would count on finding some people there who are also leading with authenticity and relatability and generosity. And, you know, it's interesting because I do a lot of networking on LinkedIn, which is a little bit different on an online platform. But I would say eight out of every 10 people that I reach via LinkedIn are wonderful and helpful and have become part of my connection. Um, and then there's one or two that are either only looking to sell you something or don't think, you know, once they hear like the size of your audience that you're not worthy of, of their time. And I will just say, um, those are not your people. So going back to the do's and don'ts, do go, just go, because the more you go, the more people you'll meet and the more experience you will get in this new field. And there's nothing wrong with letting people know you've recently launched your business or you're new to this field. And what I would really want to work with you on is how to harness the power in your backstory that makes you know that you are still unique and important even as you're in a new field. Okay, a couple more questions. Oh, what do you do when you get to a room and everyone is just talking to their friends? How do you approach groups of people who already know each other? That is so real. It's so hard, right? Which is one of the reasons why we ideally want to go with a wing woman. Yeah. Um, I would hope um, that if you are by yourself and you don't have the opportunity to be with anyone else and you're sort of on the periphery of a group, is to be able to maybe see if one of them is willing to peel off and ask a general question. So you're not even getting into you know, business stuff there or why you're networking. Something as simple as, um, is there a special cocktail at the bar tonight? Or you know, do you know what time they're serving the dinner? Or do you know many people here? And I think it's okay to be able to say, um, you know, I'm new here and I don't know anyone. Um, and my hope is that, particularly if it's a group of women, that they would be supportive. I know, Emily, you recently posted something about mean girls in the office. If you are approaching a group of women and they are just closed off, they are not letting anyone into their circle, once again, People, I would go find someone else. And most likely I would say you will find someone else who is also, um, a, a loner or in yeah. the, you can start your own group from that. But I would be curious, um, Jillian to hear if there was a specific circumstance where that happened and how you managed it and kind of what that does to you. So I write a lot. I blog at commander and And like I said, I'm happy. I love hearing other stories from people yeah. and lessons in them all. If anyone's willing to share with me um, some of their networking stories, both successes or challenges, I would love to be able to write about it because those are lessons in there. And we can also do it where you don't feel like you are exposed. Valerie, one um, addition I have to that specific question that Jillian's talking about, which I think is super relatable. I was at a Hanukkah party last night, actually, and I didn't realize until I was there that everybody else at this party was, they were all coworkers. So I walked into a party with Brad, so I wasn't completely wingmanless, but um, you know, wanting to chat with all these people, and they were all talking amongst themselves about coworkers that I didn't know. But I just, I don't know if it's like, I don't care if it's awkward, quite frankly. I, I have no shame when it comes to butting into a group conversation. I'll like lean over and be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I like couldn't help but over here. That is crazy. Are you kidding me? What, when did this happen? And then I'll just like ask a follow-up question and all of a sudden they'll like brief you and like bring you in. 
you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's really challenging, particularly when you're, you're going to network and they're just going to hang out with their friends. Right. So, um, you know, you can definitely try to get into with the group and join in the conversation and you can also move on from it. So, yeah. But if you try to butt in and you're getting the like side eye, then I'm like, okay, you're no fun anyway. Yeah. But there, there's, a, there's an element of like shamelessness to being willing to butt in and it's, it's not easy, but right. it's and Jillian, easier. I think is doing it absolutely right. As everyone's just talking about, everyone's just trying to sort of figure out what they're what they're doing with their lives, and that she goes up to them and says, "Do you mind if I join you?" Yeah, and uses herself and gets in on the conversation, and I think that's great. And I hope that you've met some great people doing that. Um, and if you haven't, then like I said, those are not your people. There are plenty of good people out there who are dealing with things similar to your current situation. Yeah. Um, it makes you vulnerable, which makes you approachable. It is hard. It is a very vulnerable thing to put yourself in this situation. But I would also focus on, you know, everything is a story. So whether it's a success or even what you might deem a failure, hey, I went because I wanted to meet this person and they, they couldn't have seemed less, less interested in me or I didn't have a good time. You know what? That's a story for the, that's one small page, one small detail in the greater story of your life. And it will not only make you a better networker, it'll make you a more relatable and generous and authentic person. So I don't think there's any way that you can do this wrong or lose in this situation. It just becomes part of your story. I love that. And on that note, our story today is coming to an end, given that we are at time. So Tell our lovely ladies here where else they can keep up with you and what kinds of ways there might be for them to learn more from you. Yes, wonderful. Well, I blog at commanderandshe.com and you can sign up for my monthly newsletter there. I talk about storytelling in all forms of career development. And you can follow me. Um, I have a page on Facebook, Commander and She. Also, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Commander in She, no hyphens there, and on LinkedIn as Valerie J. Gordon. And I would love to hear from you and hear about your latest career conundrums or challenges and successes, and um, let me know how I can be of value to you. Awesome, Valerie. Thank you so much for today's super informative really helpful, confidence-boosting webinar. Um, I've noticed throughout the chat also that we have a couple of Bossed Up Bootcamp alums in the house. So give me a little shout out in chat if you are a bootcamp alum. I saw TL, who was just in LA with our awesome yeah. California class. Um, hashtag Bossed Up Bootcamp. <laughs> I love it. If you are navigating career transition and want to get some hands-on skill building, career clarifying, courage, uh, boosting community on your side for the new year. Our next Boss Step Boot Camp is coming up the final weekend of January in Washington, D.C. So I hope to see some of you there. If you aren't already there, I've got a D.C. alum in the house. So awesome to hear from y'all and keep in touch this way. There's also lots of resources on Boss Step's blog, like this amazing webinar, which will be there very soon. Wishing everybody a happy and healthy holiday season. Happy networking for the new year. And yes, Jillian just asked if we offer scholarships for boot camp. Absolutely. There are three month installment plans and scholarships available for anyone in need. There is an FAQ section on the Boston Boot Camp landing page that has details on how to apply for a scholarship. So definitely check it out. And I'm so glad everybody's saying that this was a very helpful, wonderful webinar. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful holiday season. We'll see you in the new year. Thank you. Take care.